Hey, what's up? Welcome to the program. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Look who we got. One of the best to ever do it. UFC Hall of Famer, Randy Thanks, Couture. Man. What's up, man? Appreciate it. How's everything going? Very, very good. It's good to see you very after good. the whole hospital incident, the yeah. heart attack. I mean, yeah. you're looking pretty good for somebody who's just uh, been through know, a major health scare. I, uh, I, it was definitely a weird day, and uh, you know, I guess I have to be a little more attentive now to the thick blood. I, I learned about 15 years ago when I moved to Vegas, I was working with a, a supplement doctor, mm -hmm. uh, John Fitzgerald, and He's like, man, you got really high iron. You know, your your hematocrit and hemoglobin levels are right at the top of mm -hmm. normal, and uh, uh, you should go get blood every, you know, on a regular basis. Well, I was stationed in Germany in the 80s. Right. Uh, may have been exposed to mad cow disease, so they won't take my blood. Mm -hmm. So what have required me to to uh, work with a, a hematologist, a doctor that could take the blood and then discard it because you know blood banks don't do that. It's biohazard. So. Uh, and I'm, I haven't been as diligent as I probably should have been, but I didn't have an issue. Uh, yeah, sometimes you were just plugging along. Until something was breaks, fine. you yeah. don't know you need to fix it. So <laughs> obviously, I have to keep the blood thinned, and I feel great. I've had some great workouts back to back to normal. It's going good. It's one thing that we have all the knowledge and the information now. But you think about like the '80s. I mean, th there wasn't that same information going on. I mean, yeah. you're just doing your thing, and all of a sudden now you're thinking about what could have happened then that's impacting me now. It's a lot to handle. Yeah, I, you know, and, and thank God I was where I was at mm -hmm. when it all went down. I, you know, the month before I was camping up in Yosemite, hiking around oh and gosh. dehydrated and everything else. I, if it happened up there, it would have been a different outcome. It would yeah. have been a, a, a much different deal. So things worked out the way they're supposed to work out. Definitely. So you've had this really fascinating life from all these different standpoints. Why don't we go all the way back to the beginning? Tell me about getting into wrestling and yeah, you know, you what know, kind of piqued I, your interest I, uh, to start. I, I sometimes feel like I, I was a cat and I you know, lived about six or seven <laughs> like of my nine lives. I haven't lives. used all your nine yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well into it, but yeah, not yeah. there yet. But, uh, you know, I kind of found the sport of wrestling by accident. In, it was in the sixth grade. One of my best friends, Bobby Stevenson's brothers, were world wrestling in the junior high program, and so he's like, "Hey, my brother's wrestling. Let's go watch." So, we we rolled in there, you know, just to have fun, and they thought it was funny. They entered us in the in the novice division tournament. Hmm. Those were my first wrestling matches, and uh, yeah, I didn't know a thing about it. Never trained in or nothing, and I pinned a kid with a headlock, and I got my first bloody nose. Wow! And, no training and, at all. Yeah, and and uh, but immediately was just like, "Wow!" You know, it was this amazing thing, and. I rolled into junior high the next year, and the coach had, you know, Coach Casepear was mm -hmm. the guy that was running that tournament. It was you know, the district meet, and so he remembered me, and he's like, "Hey, wrestling starts Monday. I'll see you there." So I'm like, "Okay." I turned out, and uh, I think somewhere in my young mind, I thought, "Oh, I'd get my dad's attention." You know, and I, I knew I'd heard stories how tough my dad was and what a good wrestler he was as a kid growing mm -hmm. up, and he was never really around much. So I thought, "Well, maybe I'll go out for wrestling, and maybe he'll come around." And, that never really worked, but I found my calling for mm -hmm. sure. That's really interesting that it's the way it started for you and it didn't work out that way, but it turned into something else. So you're thinking about your dad, but then it becomes your whole life and it, much bigger than it was ever for your dad. That's absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and ultimately, at the end, it, it, it did bring us together, mm -hmm. you know, much later when I started fighting. Right. And wrestling, you know, through all through school, wrestled in the Army, wrestled through college at Oklahoma State, and then foray into mixed martial arts and uh, you know and, and that happened to coincide with about the time that he moved down retired as a welder moved down to the lower 50 he was living up in Alaska mm. the lower 48 I should say yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and and uh, we kind of reconnected I hadn't really talked in over 10 years wow. and uh, and so I started bringing him to fights and, uh, and that, so the fights kind of became something that we both shared that we were both really interested in and, and a way for us to kind of get to know each other did he finally give you the respect in that uh, I don't think he ever disrespected me. I just don't, you know, I, it, it wasn't his thing. And there's more to that story right. that we don't need to get into. Sure. But, uh, um, but yeah, it's you know, it worked out the way it's worked out. And it's the same thing. With, I was in the NCAA finals twice right. and lost twice. I was I was in the Olympic trial finals, especially in '92, '96. You're so close. All these the different guy times. that was yeah. you know, expected to make the team and win a medal and ended up losing in the final trials and never made that Olympic team. You know, that last real go around was in 96 and I was still hungry, still fired mm -hmm. up because of those setbacks. And so when 97 rolled around and I forayed into MMA, even though I was 33, almost 34 years old, I was still hungry. I was yeah. still in great shape and still competing. Uh, and so I think if I'd have won a medal or, or won that NCAA championship, I might have been satisfied. I mm. might have settled and just be a coach somewhere. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But no, but you I wanted to be still hungry. 14, yeah. yeah, this, this, this big whole segment journey. of my life. And, 
so again, you know, you just never know what the plan is and how things are going to unfold. I think it's really important you hit that because failure is a really important lesson along the way. And like it was in, in really important spots for you. Like yeah. those aren't easy losses to take. So what were the toughest moments to overcome throughout that part of your well, life? Certainly those those two, those those Olympic, mm -hmm. you know, it's a whole quadrant. It's four years yeah. to, leading into that to make you that. You dedicate and, your life for that. Yeah. And, and so it's a big deal when, when you don't make it and, and you know, devastated that, that I didn't achieve that goal. And um, you know, again, I tell people this all the time because, you know, my fight record was 19 and 11. Mm -hmm. It's not like it was pristine. Right. I had a lot of setbacks, but I think those previous wrestling setbacks created this mindset that I knew someone was coming up tomorrow. The people that really matter don't care whether you win or lose. And anybody that does care, they're not real. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're not really a fan or, or, or someone that really cares about you. And most and, people um, aren't going to remember the record after it's know, all said and done. I never done watched too. the fights I won. Yeah. I studied every single one of those ones I lost yeah. because that's where the learning was. That's where becoming a better athlete and ultimately a better man was at, was, was studying those losses and learning from that adversity. How did you grow mentally through all that, too? Well, I think that was part of it, mm -hmm. you know, finding that perspective, that frame that allowed me to keep it in perspective, to go out and, and fight and put myself out there and, and risk losing, risk maybe being embarrassed, knocked out or whatever, and realizing that at the end of the day, if that's the worst thing that ever happened to me, I was doing pretty dang good. Yeah, so, I'd I say mean, so. You know, that you had to find that, that ground you could stand on and put yourself out there. Win or lose, the people that mattered were still going to be there. No question. How about your military experience? What informed you Very, in very of formative, yeah. yeah, time in my life. Uh, you know, I was 18, got married, had mm -hmm. a baby on the way, and and uh, the service seemed like a viable way for me to support this new family. Absolutely. And, and not taking handouts from anybody and kind of do it my own way. And uh, you know, at 19 years old, it's, you know, I learned a lot. Uh, the, the, the discipline, attention to detail, that, that whole mindset affected me significantly and how I look at the world and how I solve problems and how I do things. And, and I think a lot of that prepared me for moving into fighting and now moving into acting. You know, I always joke about hurry up and wait. You know? <laughs> That's no, pretty much the wait, military, Acting yeah. is about as hurry up and wait as you get. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's been good. It's worked out. Are there a couple stories from your military experience that you still hold on to, whether positive or negative? Oh, a ton. I'm still in contact with a bunch of those guys I, I trained with. It really is a brotherhood. And, and, like people and don't understand competed that. Competed with. And now, obviously, in a different position in my life, I get to give back. I get to, you know, I have a couple foundations I'm heavily involved in. One I started myself to help some of these guys that are wounded in combat and, and in transition, kind of trying to make their way back to, to being regular civilians. And they'll never be regular civilians. Yeah. Once they've been there, they, they will always be that way. But uh, at least try to smooth out that transition and help them find their way a little bit, take that financial pressure off. The other is uh, Vets and Players, which mm -hmm. is another, you know, Merging Vets and Players, MVP is another reason why we're here. Uh, tomorrow, we've got a luncheon. We're opening the, the Manhattan branch of That's Merging awesome. Vets and Players and give these guys an outlet to go train, rub elbows with other vets, share their war stories, and, and find a comfortable place where they can vent and, and you know, stay connected and, and stop isolating themselves and, and ultimately looking down the wrong end of their, their guns. It's really easy to isolate yourself when yeah. you don't feel like you have anybody to talk to, and especially as a man, so you're kind of keeping things up a little yeah. bit, but you can just relate to other guys. That must be huge. I mean, even Both for you Both athletes when you're and, and yeah. the soldiers. We're totally. trained to, to, you know, don't bitch, complain, right. or anything. You, you know, stay on task and accomplish the mission and so to, to kind of sometimes to let say I'm struggling yeah. I, I need a little help and it's okay the VA is not doing this for me I need you know it's, it's okay to do that and so creating a place where they're comfortable to do that has been very powerful so you had all these different experiences prior to the UFC coming into your life when ultimate fighting is first presented to you what did you think about it because it looks so much different than what it is today yeah it's glitzy no, it's glamorous it, it was it was raw it was bloody it yeah. was a totally different world so what do you remember about that well, time? I mean I was focused on the competition and and uh, you know I saw Don Fry and uh, Mark Coleman you know who are guys I knew from competed against and wrestled with right. and, and and they were competing in this crazy sport and uh, so I was immediately intrigued and interested in, and saw the direct application of years and years and years of wrestling training. Um, and it was a lot different back then. You filled mm -hmm. out an application and said, oh, I'd really love to fight your show. I'd be down to be you on know, this there show. There was no yeah. amateur ranks. There was no nothing. So uh, it was a lot different back then. But I was fortunate enough 
to get in, mm -hmm. uh, get that first fight underway, and that kind of started the ball rolling. I left my coaching job to to pursue fighting and be a professional athlete, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, it's awesome. So when you think about your career, what are the big fights you still think about? What are the ones that kind of put you up on a, on a higher playing field? Uh, I think that first Belfort fight, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of ways set the tone for my entire career. How so? You know, I was a 34-year-old. Uh, you know, most people already thought I was too old. Right, you're not uh, supposed to be there, young, you're not supposed to be the guy. Here's this young yeah. kid that's literally just blowing through everybody. Mm. I think he had three fights or four fights at that time with an aggregate time of under three minutes for all four fights. Uh, and that's who they wanted to match me up with after that first tournament. Um, and so I don't think anybody gave me a snowball's chance in hell to win in that fight. And I came through, you know, knew if I got my hands on him and, and made him work and made him wrestle, I had a good chance of winning, and it worked out that way. And so I think that kind of set the stage for several other fights in my career. You know, certainly rolling into the first Chuck Liddell fight, mm -hmm. you know, I think they were trying to use me to put Chuck over as the guy they were going to make the new champ because Tito wouldn't fight him. Right. That whole thing was going on, and uh, I think they expected me to lose. I had just lost twice in the heavyweight division. Uh, those were my first two losses, and uh, so uh, they, I think they thought they were. I was on my way out, mm. and uh, obviously it didn't go that way. The yeah. first fight went you really well for me, and yeah. now it went, you know, right back up. Uh, fought Tito next, and and again another one where nobody thought I was going to be able to to win that. Uh, I was 40, 42, I think, going wow. into that fight Crazy. somewhere up there, and. Uh, you know, again, huge underdog, nobody really giving me much of a chance. Same thing with Tim Sylvia and mm -hmm. Brock Lesnar. I mean, that just that kind, kind of, of story, been the story just of your life repeated in a sense. over yeah. and over and over in, in a lot of ways. So when you fought Tito Ortiz, what do you still remember about just going up against him as a competitor? Like, what did he do well that you struggled against? Well, I, I analyzed him and recognized that he, he was using a lot of the same skill sets that I used to mm -hmm. win fights, and that came down to wrestling. Yeah. You know, he, he won 95% or more of his fights by taking guys down, establishing that top position, hovering over them, landing elbows, landing punches, and wearing them out that way. And I did a lot of those same things. Right. So in my mind, this was wrestling. This was wrestling 101. One of us was gonna have to out-wrestle the other one. And, and I was pretty sure that with my wrestling credentials and background that, that I was gonna have a, a chance in the upper hand. So. And that's kind of how it unfolded. Yeah, I got the takedowns right. every single round and kind of established that. And that first takedown was the key. He mm. was in deep. I think I was sprawled <laughs> out there for two or three minutes in that first round and finally turned the tables and took him down and uh, ended up on top instead of him on top of me. So, And then that kind of set the pace for the yeah. rest of the fight. I mean, there's a lot of great fighters now, but the guys that you're going against... Ortiz, Liddell, Lesnar, I mean, these guys are just massive human beings. Like, when you think about Chuck Liddell, like, what sticks out in your memory about those Well, Chuck is really the only guy that ever knocked me out. Mm. I mean, I've been flashed before, Brock right. flashed but me. That was the worst it know, got with but Liddell. But, I mean, I lost a little piece of time. Mm. You know, I was there one second, the next second, I'm like, whoa. Like, where am who, I? Who are these guys? Yeah. You know, what, what happened? And, and so that was, he was the only guy that really hit me that hard and knocked me out. Um, you know, and he was just so good at that, so good at finding that range with those mm -hmm. long levers and yeah, that stance, uh, yeah. using his wrestling to keep guys standing and, and make guys strike with him. So, uh, you know, the fun part is now we're you know we're friends. We get to you know, right. we get to hang out with Tito now and then mm -hmm. and Chuck now and then, and you know, we share that that journey and that background. Were you guys friends then, or was it just all? We those? had met then, and we and uh -huh. we got along. I always got along with all those guys. Right. You know, even Tito. You know, he was more on the brass side sure. and kind of used his, he was one of the first guy to use his mouth to mm. market himself and all that. You know, obviously, Chael Sonnen and, yep. and Conor McGregor and it some of those guys have kind of throughout. elevated yeah. that to a whole new level, but uh, he was kind of the first guy to do that. You know, Tank did it a little bit, mm. and I think that's what got Tito yeah. in that mode, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I still always got along with those guys and never had any animosity or issues with anybody that I fought. Mm. I just, wasn't in my nature. Yeah, I feel you. Whether it's the UFC today or, or PFL, when you think about what it looks like today and thinking about it back then, like what are the biggest differences? Like what, what's most yeah, startling about I mean, life it, now? Obviously, the, the level of athlete and the science and athletics right. has certainly bled over to just dialed sports. up to a whole and, different level. You know, guys are getting more out of their bodies into their 40s. Mm -hmm. You know, myself included, Dan Henderson, a lot right. of us fought way into our 40s. And you see that across the board in all sports. Yeah, totally. so, 
but the you know and tactics technique seems to go in in circles. You know, something will hit and someone will pull it off in a fight and like oh my gosh, and then everybody's trying to do that. Right, everybody's trying to copy it. Just it just kind of goes in yeah. cycles like that, uh, and that's fun to watch. But the athletes as a whole are just a lot better. They are mixed martial artists. Mm. I think back when I started, everybody was out to prove that their style was the best right. fighting style, and then we quickly realized. There is no such thing. There is no one style. This has become this kind of amalgamated hybrid sport in and of itself, and in a lot of ways, uh, the combative sport for this generation. Yeah, totally. How about your life after you stop fighting? Because it's like coming back from the military is one thing. Your identity mm -hmm. was then as a fighter. So what did some of those early days look like for you? Just trying to find your identity yeah, outside of it. You're absolutely right. And, and that's, uh, I feel fortunate. And I think that's what a lot of our retired ball players mm -hmm. and, a, and a lot of our veterans struggle with is who are they now? Yeah. You know, depending on how long they served, but that, that's a huge, you know, that training, that you are entrenched in that, that literally becomes who you are, and then you strip all that away and throw them back into the civilian world. It just does not work that way. Yeah, there's They're no special. There's 1% of the population that has either worn that military uniform and gone on the battlefield, or worn a, a professional you know, athlete's uniform and, and walked out into that professional venue too. They're very special individuals, so they, they don't generally assimilate well. So finding that purpose, for me, I, I was fortunate. When I got out of the Army, I was going right into college and wrestling mm -hmm. at Oklahoma State and you know, getting my degree and winning that national championship for both the team and an indi my individual goals. Uh, that's what it was all about, and, and uh, that consumed me. And then when I retired from, from wrestling in 2000, I was already fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and fighting had kind of filled that competitive void for me, and I did that for 14 years. Walking away from that was a big decision yeah. for me. Um, Thankfully, I you know I had acting and all these other business adventures, and I say adventures because that's what they've been. They definitely, I'm uh, sure, have been that. They've yeah. been a challenge and a lot of ups and downs, but it's been a lot of fun. And so now that you know, I get to focus on those things and very passionate about the acting. I'm having a lot of fun doing that. Yeah, why don't we talk about the acting? Because that's a cool little chapter of your story. So how'd you get into it, and what have been some well, of your favorite parts Well, they were parts looking for authentic cage fighters for Cradle to you the Grave. You fit that, Bill. Oh, yeah, yeah it's kind of a <laughs> no-brainer, right? So me, Chuck, and Tito all had, all had small parts nice. in that fight scene in Cradle to the Grave. I had, you know, one line in the movie. Hmm. You know, I, I, you know, it's a swear word in it, so I probably <laughs> won't say it here. But, uh, uh, you know, it was fun and interesting, but it was kind of like going to Oz mm. and pulling back the curtain yeah, and seeing yeah. the guy pulling the levers and making the smoke and the fire and all that stuff happened. And I was immediately intrigued by that and, and that whole process. And so I started taking some acting classes, went out and got an agent and started trying to get better jobs and more interesting jobs. But fighting always came first. Mm. Now I retired from fighting in 2011. I can just focus on that and, and having fun, you know, Getting, getting acting jobs, doing auditions, trying to get better, and every time I go out, that's been 20 years now, so every time I go out, I feel like I learned something yeah. new. I, I, you know, you find a way to tell the truth, to portray this character, even if you have to make up some backstory of why he's doing the crazy things he's doing, you gotta, you gotta find a way to tell the truth. Yeah, you gotta find a way to get comfortable with that character mm -hmm. and also find a truth to it. And it's not something that happens overnight. People just look at acting and be like, oh yeah, I could do that. But it's like, yeah. no, it's a lot of rejection and you've experienced rejection in your life. And it's exactly. like you said, a lot of hurry up and wait because you don't know when things are actually gonna hit, yep. if you're actually gonna get a part. Or it's like, I may do this movie two years from now and then it may not come out for another three, four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it, it's definitely an interesting business. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. You have the Expendables 4 coming out? I uh, got the script, um, excited. Every time I read one of these, I'm like, man, how in the hell are we going to do that? <laughs> uh, and then, you know, movie magic, man, we pull it off. So the script is amazing. I'm really excited to get back to work with all those guys and see everybody. It's like old home week. Right. You know, you're back in the locker room suiting yeah, up yeah. to go, you know, to go out. And, and uh, so it, this, this spring coming up, it looks like we're going to get greenlit to start filming for. So. That's awesome, and then hopefully at some point we'll see that a little bit down the road. Yeah, those are bigger. They'll take mm -hmm. a year probably right. to get get out to the theaters and everything. I just finished a western oh, yeah? with Michael Jai White that was a lot of oh, fun, nice. and it's a comedy on top of that. Mm. So I think it's going to be good. It'd be one of those cult classic potentials. So. I love it. I just love the diversity of all, of all the different stuff in the TV and movie business now. It's like stuff like that. You got the big box office with Arnold and Sly, but it's like there's something for everybody, which I think yeah, is a good thing. Absolutely. And I think you're seeing a lot of groundbreaking stuff happen in the indie world, in the independent totally. film world. Now the other studios 
are a little less willing to take mm -hmm. any big risks. They're kind of doing a lot of reboots. And all, you know, but the independent like film but game is awesome big, now. Yeah. And it's all out there on streaming. So you could be home one night and you're just scrolling through and you find yep. a really good movie. It's not going to be out in the theaters, but you mm -hmm. can find something really yeah, good. Yeah, the, the uh, industry is definitely changing with all the digital platforms mm -hmm. and everything. It's, it's changing the movie industry a lot. There's a lot of that middle ground has kind of right. gone away. You know, the, it's either the big tentpole mm -hmm. studio things or, or this or kind the of smaller independent. The smaller independent stuff. And I think that's where all the risks and the interesting stuff are being taken. Definitely. Who are some of your favorite actors, whether you've worked with them or just people growing up? That yeah, you well, I've by. always been a Stallone fan. Mm -hmm. So to actually be in a film with him and Crazy. he's directing and he wrote this <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, am I really here? It's so, a pinch me moment. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that, that, you know, Rambo was. The original Rambo mm -hmm. was filmed in Hope, Washington. You know, that's where I grew up. Right, you're watching In guy. Washington, yeah. and, and so attracted to that. Uh, a vision quest. Mm. I just heard that they might be making a new Ooh. vision quest, and I'm like, please. Put me in, whatever I, I have to do. Spokane, Washington, <laughs> I was that I'm high guy. school wrestler. That was me. <laughs> yes. So, uh, absolutely one of my favorite films. You know, I've, I've been dating a gal now for about going on six years. Like, you haven't seen Vision <laughs> Quest? That's it. We have to make this happen. So. You know, prerequisite. <laughs> Definitely. We had Matthew Modine here uh, a couple oh, yeah? months back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Joker. Yeah, it's amazing to see how far he's covered there. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. Definitely. But, uh, Why don't we talk a little PFL here? Because you guys yes. are going to be here at Madison Square Garden New Year's Eve. What's it been like growing this thing out for you? It's been very exciting, you know, and, and I'll, I'll be honest. I, when they first showed me this format, I had my questions. What like, were your oh biggest gosh, questions? You guys are going to turn these guys around every six weeks? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot. And you'd look at what they're doing. I mean, we start our season in May, and these guys are going to fight five times by the time we get to New Year's wow. to the finale. That is they're really winning. Quick. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's seven months you're fighting five times. Now, uh, that was my question. Mm -hmm. And I fought in tournaments. I fought twice right. in one night a lot when I was first entering the sport. It never bothered me. And it's a technical and tactical challenge. You don't know who's going to advance, who to prepare, how to prepare, and sharpen the appropriate tools. Sometimes you have to do that on the fly, right. to, you know, going in and. All these guys have just really stepped up and embraced the, the, the whole thing. I think eliminating the elbows was very smart. Mm -hmm. Kind of minimized the cuts or potential cuts with the elbows. But other than that, we're using the unified rules. And, and uh, my, I've been most impressed with these athletes, how they've stepped up and embraced that adversity, embraced that grind. You know, 70% finish rate throughout the regular. I mean, it's just remarkable. And uh, that's a tribute to those athletes. And, and those are the guys I admire. And, and respect anybody that walked those four yeah. steps up into that cage. <laughs> Got to um, be a tough son of a gun. And, and you know, the Professional Fighters League is really taking care of these fighters. Taking, you know, they're allowed to get sponsors again. They're not making them wear uniforms. Right. Or, and that's huge too, just things. to make yeah. a few bucks here and there. Because so, that, that's the toughest part of the fight game is that some of these people can't make the money. Yeah. You know, absolutely correct. And and they're they're really taking care of the fighters well. I think the fighters appreciate that. And a lot of these guys, you know, they're getting a crack at, at getting in the finals and mm -hmm. winning a million bucks. I mean, that's life-changing money. Absolutely so. life-changing. Do you remember when your life changed in terms of financial compensation? Like, well, I mean, honestly, my very first fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I fight in that tournament. I fought twice in UFC 13, and they paid me $20,000 for yeah. that night. And I was paying, I was making $25,000 for the year wow. as an assistant So in one coach. night, you made so as much as So one night, made I made almost as much as I made in the whole year. It was, you know, it was like, wow. Yeah. And what, you want me to fight again in three months? <laughs> like, great. All right, I'm in, yeah. <laughs> so That's pretty cool. Yeah. I can remember a time in New York when this type of stuff wasn't, wasn't even happening. Allowed, yeah, yeah, remember it was banned. Yeah, you it's, would, it's this not was that the holdout state. Yeah. And uh, that's an interesting story of why that was yeah. and, and the politics and everything that was going on with that. But there's such an appetite for it here in New York, especially Madison Square oh, Garden. Huge fan base here. And, you know, even when it was still banned, right. you know, holding those in, in Jersey. Oh, yeah, you just you just hop right over the bridge. in the metal yeah. hands, you know. <laughs> I went to a lot of those fights. They I'm were sure fun. you did. So you never fought at the Garden? No. Right. My that, son did. He did? Ryan did. Oh, yeah. when was that? Three years ago. Okay. In Bellator. What was it like watching him? Amazing. Amazing venue, amazing. He got to literally weigh in on the scale that Muhammad Ali weighed wow. in on at Madison Square Garden. I mean, it was remarkable. And Bellator has come a long way, too. We've had a ton of those guys come through. They, they are doing a great job. I, I'm a, uh, I, I like Scott Coker a mm -hmm. lot. He's a genuine friend, and he's one of those handshake guys. Yeah. He doesn't need a contract. He says you're going to do that, that he's going to do that. Obviously, but it'll the actually take way care of the world, you have to do contracts sure. and stuff now. But uh, he's just always been that that you know, hold to his word, going to do exactly what he said he did. I loved when he took over the company, the first thing he did was get rid of all the lawyers that they were using to, <laughs> to sue the fighters. Well, that's going to help the fighters. Yeah. The fighters are going to be pumped about that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I uh, my son fights for Bellator 
has been for, for a majority of his career, and I think he's, he's kind of winding down. He's been fighting for over 10 years, wow. so. But I'll, I'll always have uh, nothing but good things to say about Bellator and, and Scott Coker. It's amazing how fighting has been a theme throughout the lives of a few different men in, in your family. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. worked out. Not too bad. So when people do check this out, New Year's Eve, what are some of the big things you want them to well, take away? Well, first thinking? of all, uh, one of the things I love about this format is you get to c you pick your fighters early mm -hmm. and, and you get to follow them all the way through this seven month season and all five of their fights if they made it to the finals and you know seeing them fight twice in one night for the quarterfinals and the semifinals and so from a fan perspective you really kind of get to know the guys you want to root for and the guys you want to root against right. and all that sort of thing uh, w which is one of the things that I think other professional sports enjoy. Uh, and not that everybody doesn't have their favorite fighter in prize fighting too, but to kind of treat it more like a true sport and a sport championship, I, I like that. It's pretty cool, yeah. Uh, it's different. Um, other than that, they're gonna see, you know, I think we had 16 countries involved wow. in, in the regular season. I think we're five, you know, the finals are set now for New Year's Eve where there are five different countries represented. We get the first athlete from Tajikistan competing oh in the finales. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Argentina, Brazil, the Americans, uh, there, there's just a whole bunch of Russians, obviously. Uh, it'll be a great night of fights, and you'll literally see six new millionaires walk out of that building on, on New Year's Eve right before the ball drops in Times Square. That's pretty Square. cool. Not yeah. a bad deal. Do these guys reach out to you in terms of advice? Some or, of them or train, like even yeah. the UFC guys, like are they hitting you up? Or? I have about 40 guys that train, train at Extreme Couture in Las Vegas mm -hmm. and then a few other uh, like Ava Knight's fighting mm -hmm. for Bellator now and, she, and, and we're kind of steering her and helping her technically in, in her career and she transitions from boxing into right. MMA and uh, we've had a couple other guys at Unbreakable in, in LA and then you know, a whole team of guys at Extreme Couture. They're in various organizations, various levels from amateur into the pro ranks. And so it's always fun for me to, to number one, be around those guys. Absolutely, that's, yeah, you know, it keeps my, you going. That's where I'm, where I'm from. And, uh, and then to be able to impart any kind of technical or, or professional wisdom that I learned through 20 years of being involved in this uh, is always fun and, and rewarding. Are you a guy that still watches it religiously? Like, are you checking it out this weekend? Especially if my guys. Especially yeah. if it's your guys. And I just did a photo shoot with Colby Covington uh, for How It's Her Clothing. Oh, and, nice. Okay. And, and uh, you like so his I'm game? excited. Yeah. I do, yeah. I think he's, you know, he, he's he's vocal, mm -hmm. he, but he's standing up for what he believes in, yeah. and, and I'm never going to fault anybody for that. Um, yeah, I think he, it's going to be a, an interesting fight, and I think he's going to set the tone and the pace, and I, I like it. I like his chances in that fight. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's things like that. Guys I meet that right. I actually know, then I'm going to tune in and see how they do. Yeah, you're personally invested yeah, Exactly. Now. Absolutely. That's, that's, I think, sometimes what's missing now is we've gotten so saturated. Yeah. There's a fight or two every weekend. It's and true. And so, uh, again, creating that vested interest in a guy you want to see compete, whether you want to see him get his butt whooped <laughs> or you want to see him get his hand raised, right. doesn't matter. And, and I think that's what this format with the PFL does really, really well. Yeah, it's cool that it's mainstream and that ESPN is in the game now. That, yeah. that helps out tremendously. Huge, you know, not that NB, NBCSN wasn't mm -hmm. bad last year, but it's no, more it's a good the start. golf NASCAR, right. you know, demographic instead of the MMA demographic. Right, with the so. ESPN Plus thing with MMA, it's like, a place to be. It's great. Awesome. Randy, thanks a lot, man. Pleasure, man. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. That's Randy. I'm DJ. See you next time. You're on the sit-down.